thank you, the family, for having me here tonight. It's always a big pleasure. I think the family and TransferWise, where I work, we already chatted about this. We do share similar missions, just from different angles. My name is Carrillo, and I'm a software engineer. So I'll ask the only question that haven't been asked so far. Uh, how many of you do engineering at all? How many of you code? All right, cool. Uh, slightly more than I expected, nice. Um, I'm an engineer uh, doing a product talk, one of the first ones for me. So it's always nice to yeah, get new experiences. I work at TransferWise, and we're a money transfer business. Money transfer businesses exist since the beginning of time when currencies were invented. At first, they were invented for the kings and lords to separate around their own stuff independently. And somehow, in a globalized world, the concept of a currency still exists. And thus, there are leeches that make money on people exchanging currencies. Because a value in currency, in one currency and in another, within an exchange rate, should be the same. Why does a money transfer with your bank cost you 6% every time? That's why, unlike banks, TransferWise was started from a problem. We're founded by two Estonians, Christo and David. David's been uh, Skype's first employee uh, way back. And they both shared a problem. David's been living in London but getting his salary from Skype in euros. And Christo's been uh, doing consulting at Deloitte uh, in London but had a mortgage back in Estonia back home. So they both needed to exchange currencies on a monthly basis. And every time they've been using their banks for a couple of years, and over the years, especially if you're buying a house, it actually turns out a pretty big sum. So essentially, you're just paying somebody to transfer your money, 6% uh, of your house. Um, it's not that simple. So they started exchanging money between them, and kind of worked out. And then they realized, divine intervention, uh, that there's actually dozens of millions of people that do the same. A bunch of expats, every day more, Berlin's a good example for that. How do we, we're 10 times cheaper than the banks. And how do we work? How do we make this work? Essentially, ChanceWise is a very simple company. Uh, we own a couple of hundreds of bank accounts all over the world. And whenever a person wants to send euros, say from Germany to UK, we try to find a person that wants to send the money backwards. And if we, want, if we find a match, boom. We get the money in one currency, pay out in another, problem solved. Of course, uh, there will be no 100% match ever. The amount and flows are very different, regulations very different, but we strive towards a peer-to-peer -peer kind of a money transfer system. And it's a very simple concept, and I think the one thing that governs it is that money actually doesn't cross any borders. If we send money, if it, person sends money to Germany, what actually happens is we have a German bank and come and we do a local transfer. And the only thing that connects those hundreds of bank accounts is actually our platform. If you think about it, a huge bank, say Deutsche Bank, that is operating all over the globe, could have started something like TransferWise at any point in time over the last hundred years. But they didn't. The question is why? Banks exist for like 400 years, and it's a kind of a common agreement that, well, five, six percent, well, seems fair. There's no incentive for the banks to change because it's a common agreement. And they do it just because they can. Well, people use banks for the past 400 years, they're going to use them for the next 100 minimum. Might as well make the most of it, right? We're different because we actually do have a mission. Actually, we were running for like five years without a mission. We are just doing our stuff. Uh, we believed in certain things. We realized back in December that it would be nice to get something in writing. So our founder sat down and came up with this. We're trying to build a concept of money without borders. And thus, as a business, money transfer 
should be instant, should be transparent, should be convenient, and eventually should be free. Because if you think about it, a money transfer is one record in one database ending up as another record in another. Why should it cost more than electricity consumed to transfer that data across the globe? It shouldn't. The market responded over the last five years. We've grown quite a bit. Five years ago, we were transferring like $500,000 per month. Now we're transferring over a billion. And that's thank you to our team. We grow tenfold over the last five years, and we've learned a lot. How did we grow besides venture capital and equity? You cannot buy anything with money. Our biggest driver of growth now, and for the last three years, naturally, the vast majority of people that join TransferWise join from a recommendation, from somebody telling them. And the interesting part here is that money transfer is not necessarily a topic people talk over a beer about. It's very private. But still, majority of our customers drive from word of mouth. We, as a company, we, had, we try to believe, uh, we're not sure, that we can create evangelical customers that will tell their friends about us. Then we started thinking, why do people recommend our product? S splits out into rational and emotional, obviously. Rational is being governed by product. People recommend because the product is good or not. And emotional is being governed by cause. What we're trying to do is we're trying to create a movement of people that are mindfully aware that they're getting ripped off and that believe that they should stop. The product is dissolved, obviously, into a couple of levers, metrics that we use to measure whether the product is good. And it all comes down from a mission. For us, it's important that the transfers should be instant, free, transparent. We, can, we should be able to transfer money anywhere in the world, and people should trust us. But here's the thing. When you're building a financial company in the 21st century, to actually get people to use you, to achieve advocacy of your product, your product literally needs to be 10 times better than any alternative. If you're going to be 5% cheaper than the bank, nobody will use you because, well, the connection to a bank is so, so deep that only a tenfold difference can actually start driving change. And if you work really, really hard, you will get from rational to emotional. You will create stories that you will tell to your customers. We're a young startup once, so we had like fun ads, and we did stripping in central London, and a bunch of other stunts. It's part of the deal. But as we grew older, <clears throat> more, te more stories emerged. Sending money from Netherlands to UK in 20 seconds. Nobody could have thought about that five years ago. Or Deutsche Bank calling our customers, saying like, hey, what's this thing called TransferWise? It's fun. Uh, we're sending a billion dollars per month. Banks still don't notice us. That's awesome. Obviously, all of this is not possible by having a classical bank-wise organization where there is VP of sales, VP of loans, VP of, I don't know, master of the universe that's telling people what to do. So we tried to adopt a new way of building products. We're not the first ones to play with this idea. Companies like Airbnb, Spotify, Valve, we all play around the same concept over the last couple of years, just in different forms. Some people call it a holacracy. The way it really works is that we believe that our product is an outcome of people that we hire and the decisions that they make. Obvious, right? And once we hire the person, the biggest influence is the culture that drives the decision making and the values that we share. What it means in reality is that we are 600 people, 50 teams. 
we work in independent autonomous teams that have KPIs to measure their impact. And every KPI is connected to a specific customer problem. And if we solve that problem, hopefully, that will drive our growth. To go through the vocabulary a little bit, autonomous means every team needs to have all the talent within the team that it will help solve the problem. Our work in currencies and banking, I know nothing about banking. I didn't know nothing about finance, because like, TransferWise is the first financial company I joined. But there's a lot of banking to do, a lot of relationships to maintain. That's why we hired a banker. Some teams hire designers, some teams embed marketeers into their teams in order to achieve their goals. And every KPI, obviously teams need to have KPIs to measure whether they're making any impact. We believe that it needs to come from a customer problem. And it's kind of obvious, right? Like who else than a person with a hands-on domain knowledge can do the best job possible? Obviously, I don't know, the CEO or the VP of engineering doesn't have all the depth of your domain when you're working and grinding on a problem tirelessly for months. No way. The stuff that I'm gonna talk next, like a lot of people within the company uh, do not agree with me on that. I've been building uh, the European product uh, with the team for the last 18 months and there are a couple of things that we've learned on doing product that might be worth sharing. It all started out as a currencies team. We're a team of integrators, people who integrated with banks. Every country, every region has their own rules, regulations, payment cycles, clearing houses, you name it. There's a whole infrastructure uh, that lies beyond that. And we're a team of professionals that we're just doing it one by one by one. Our metric was MNUs, monthly new users. What's the simplest way to get MNUs? Uh, you, you launch new currencies. You suddenly go from zero to N, yay your metric moved. And the way we did this is we just launched a questionnaire on our website because we do believe that we do need to engineer for customer impact. And we don't want to spend engineering time building something that's not needed. The only people that can tell us what's needed are our customers. It's in our values. It's in our core. That's why let's ask customers which currencies to launch. Let's see if anything stands out. Turns out it does. Some countries, some regions, some events make some countries strive towards a solution more. And it's been all fine and dandy. But A, you kind of run out of currencies over time. And B, some currencies grow fast. Brazil's been our biggest driver of growth over the last year, weirdly. We didn't even realize that. Some currencies just don't. We launched Croatia. We got a couple of hundred MNUs. But there is, like, besides the price, we are like 10 times cheaper than the bank. There's n really nothing special about the product. We're not that fast. We don't communicate really well. It's a huge turnout. We don't provide support in Croatian. We don't have the language. It's just nothing special yet. And honestly, some countries do have just more opportunity, more people living in them, more expats living in them. So it stops being simple. And we're thinking, what to do? We're a very customer-focused company. So we decided a couple of years ago that we will take NPS, Net Promoter Score. Everyone knows what's NPS? All right, um, cool. We took NPS as our main product metric. What is NPS? Everyone's seen, how luckily are you going to recommend our service to their friends, right? Google does it, Netflix does it, everybody does it. This is NPS measuring. And we count, yeah, there's a whole bunch of signs behind that explaining why nines and tens are promoters, sevens and eights are neutrals, and everything else are detractors. And an NPS is essentially a difference between promoters and detractors divided by a total amount of people who responded. So it might be negative, might be positive, the limit is 100. And there's a very simple concept behind it, that if there are more promoters than detractors, then you will grow. So there are more people that are extremely excited about your product than people that are extremely unhappy. That you will grow to an extent. The question is, how fast? That's why when we started playing with MPS as our main metric within a team, we realized that there's three huge problems with it. A, it doesn't mean nothing uh, if your product doesn't work. 
So if your MPS is five, you'll probably run out of money earlier than you will actually get any growth and traction. So it only means something if your product really works really well. If your MPS is less than 50, 60, 70, really like just try and build the product first. Try to solve a problem first that makes people happy and only then start doing everything else. That's why when we're building products in TransferWise, we're 50 teams, right? I don't know what like 40 teams in the company are doing. So we're constantly launching and maintaining and building new products. Some of them I don't know about. But our main idea is that when we are building new products in our team, we only start measuring NPS and start considering it uh, in our future plans if we know that the product is working and we have good traction. So that's problem number one. Problem number two, NPS as a metric is elusive and evasive. It tries to, to deceive you with every possible way. First of all, it's sentimental. You ask people, people may be in a bad mood. People may, I don't know, I think in some schools in Germany, one's the best mark. Some, some people may be super excited, and give you a one and you count them into detractors and like it's all skewed up and doesn't make any sense. So the only thing that does make sense is our actual comments. Second, even if you have competitors, comparing your NPS to your competitors doesn't give you nothing. Just because we tried it out itself, if you start measuring NPS in one piece of the product and in another, the same product, you will get completely different results. Just because incentivizing people to give you feedback is a very complex mechanism. That's why a, comparing yourself to a competitor via MPS is just impossible. MPS exists for you to compare yourself previously to you in the future. That's one. And two, like one piece of advice, just pick the most important spot in your product and measure your MPS there. For TransferWise, we send a survey whenever the transfer is completely finished, meaning the recipient received the money. So the process, the transaction is finished, and that's the only spot where we ask for this kind of feedback, and we ask for it for like five years, and only then, over time, MPS may become useful. And yeah, MPS does, a, does have a crazy time lag. Stuff that you do this quarter may result in MPS change somewhere by the end of the year. And it's really hard to move once you've reached a product market fit, it's crazily hard to move significantly. Whenever some product launches and we are able to actually verify and prove that we moved MPS by two points, that's a huge deal. Long story short, I love this uh, quote very much. Um, yeah, truth is actually rarely pure and absolutely never it is simple. But we have to deal with it, right? So we have this thinking that actually MPS is a combination of a bunch of different things. It's a combination of all product changes that are happening in your company. So the, solu the obvious solution is going to be growth hacks. Like there's so many changes happening. Like e obviously everyone read like the classical medium story about growth hacking one on one. And like, yay, let's make the login form simpler and we'll raise conversion twice. What happens next? Nobody cares about that because, well, you measure conversion on this step. In fact, most of the products, a product's complexity rises over time. Apps that you've seen 10 years ago, right now, they just seem rudimentary. They're so simple. The complexity grows year by year in an exponential dependency. We tried a bunch of these things. They like, really don't work as long as your core product doesn't work. And duh, Europe is very diverse. Can you imagine comparing a person, I don't know, running a vineyard somewhere in Toscana or a person in a Norwegian wilderness, comparing their behavior when clicking on a login form? Like, seriously? We discovered that our customers, A, use us differently for different reasons. They talk about us differently. They expect different things from a money transfer service and they generally care about different things in life. And besides that, there's another layer of complexity. Different payment schemes, different payment methods, different routines, all that sort of stuff. 
it turns out that every country in Europe is radically different, although most of us are governed by the same currency. So we ask question to ourselves, is there one silver bullet that will help us conquer Europe? Like we have growth A, we want to be exponential, can we do that? Turns out, no, uh, it turns out into 5,000 small battles, 0.1% here, 0.2% here, tirelessly executing, will probably sum up in some NPS difference and thus lead to growth. All right, where to go? We believe that NPS is driven by product pillars. We've talked about them er earlier. For us, it's speed, price, convenience, coverage, and trust. How do, did we actually identify them? Because, as I've said earlier, our mission came way later. And the pillars were identified like three years ago, four years ago. We categorized all MPS comments all time. Literally every comment we ever received. We called up people that we didn't understand what they wrote. Sometimes people get emotional. That's why me personally, everyone in the team, we spend time talking to our customers and calling them if we don't understand anything. And we're doing this a lot. There's actually some pretty amazing companies that do that kind of for you, like Chattermill, I think. They do a pretty good job. We're trying them out. Or we'll try, I don't know. Um, but we did the job and realized that 99.5% fall into those buckets. That's pretty much it. And that's, I think, uh, pretty reusable advice. Just categorize comments and you will see pillars that your customers actually care about. So now what to choose between those pillars, even one layer of granularity. And we're a five-man team that is running 30 plus countries. It's just impossible to do even a dent and you constantly reevaluate yourself. Come on, like, am I making a difference? Should we hire 20 people more? Or, like, not? Or can we do something differently? What we decided is that we're embracing a ruthless prioritization. And we govern it by six principles that are became principles not that far away. First of all, we ignore things that don't align with our values. We didn't always do it. So at some point in time, we said that we are always eight times cheaper than the banks. Um, turns out like we're not, if you're sending money, say, from Denmark to Germany for certain amounts, for certain banks, you may end up with a better deal than using us. Truth is, we just didn't check. Or we don't tell up front um, that we don't deal with cash. It's kind of obvious, but we just didn't figure out to tell it. Like, it's actually a pretty big problem in Bulgaria. People just use cash, um, and we cannot serve them. So that's why we need to tell them. And it took us two years to realize that it's terrible. And a bunch of other examples. What is important here, why did we accept this, is that it's, we believe that it's so important to create a practice in your organization to do things that are right and that doing them is good, even though it hurts your conversion a little bit in, in the short run, because all in all, we're trying to build companies that will last for decades. And we're like, and doing things right, well, historically, it's just the right way to go. We ignore things that do not align with our product pillars, five buckets, everything else. Sorry, don't have time for that. We don't do things that are not backed up with qualitative, MPS, calls, customer support, or quantitative data. Uh, but we also need to remember that gathering data is not a purpose in itself. We do try to use data to validate our conviction in some things. And after you validated something, and that contradicts the previous uh, speaker, actually, we believe that there's rarely a need to test every decision you make. In fact, over-testing, I think Skyscanner has a very similar, uh, very good article. Um, over-testing might slow down your speed. And if you're a startup, and if you're wrong, young, speed is the only thing you got, like, and a little bit of money. That's our competitive advantage. If, if we're not fast enough, then we'll just die. A simple example. Uh, launching languages and localizing. It's good to understand that your customers care about language. 
it's good to measure historical language launches just to see what to expect to do projections. But doing an A-B test for every single language for six months to get statistical significance on every single step, this means 50% of your customers or whatever the split you choose uh, just get their native language stolen from them. It might be just worthless. We do ignore personal sentiment. Um, I'm a Ukrainian, so like I want to do good for the Ukrainian integration very much because I send money there every month. Um, but I'm not our customer. In fact, yeah, I joined like everybody else by word of mouth. But the truth is there's so many more use cases and your personal opinion really doesn't matter. Your personal emotion really does not matter. We do ignore things, we need to be truthful with ourselves, and we do ignore things that we don't know how to measure. For instance, our team does not know how to measure convenience. Like the only convenience metric we know is conversion. That's simple to, to measure, but there's so many more. The topic is much more complex, and we don't know nothing about it. Some teams are slightly far ahead. We're lagging, that's why we decided, all right, we focus on speed. Just because it's a simple metric, we know how to measure it really well, we're going to go for it. And lastly, we ignore things that we cannot change within our cycle. TransferWise runs in three-month cycles. Whatever the cycle you choose, just to give you a little bit, to give yourself a little bit of headspace, ignore things that you cannot change. For instance, like we cannot cover some countries in a quarter, and then we'll just forget about them for three, three months and, well, see what happens. And I do believe that a bunch of the products, the majority of products that are, that are being built uh, nowadays, it's very rarely a rocket science. And I do believe that continuous effort and not strength, not intelligence, not divine intervention is the key to unlocking our potential. It's actually the work, the grinding. That's why we adopted a new routine. It's going to go very quickly. I think I'm taking too much time for that. Um, we ask our customers, obviously. And there's a lot of angry comments, and all of them are promoters. Once again, read your comments. Numbers don't mean nothing. We gather quantitative data, so many metrics. There's thousands of them. What we try to do is we cr try to create representative aggregate metrics. As an, as an example, last quarter, so we're focusing on speed, right? And we're like, okay, we have N MNUs uh, per month. Let's measure the amount of hours saved to our customers per month, which is a very simple aggregate. But it actually brings a bunch of your priorities straight. If you think that every hour is real people sending money. Um, and playing with those ideas proved to be very valuable. The most important thing here is execute tirelessly and do hire people that get shit done uh, there's no place for lazy people in startups, literally. The most important thing here is reevaluate. And that's a tricky one. Because when you're working tirelessly on a certain product, you get attached to it. And it's an emotional bond than a rational one. And it's very hard to let go. And we constantly don't know what we're doing, whether we're doing it right. Are we, are we changing anything? But the thing is, I've asked a bunch of founders um, over time, how did you make it? How did you end up in a good place? There's a bunch of people that started answering, like, yeah, kitty, yeah, kitty, we just, like, yeah, we just raised really well, hard, we're really lucky, I'm so grateful, that kind of stuff. Um, the good founders answered the same. We did not give up because there's never going to be a company that doesn't go through a pitch, pitch dark place. In fact, a lot of the companies are constantly in it, and it's a good feeling to have. And I do believe that if, if you're not tired, you're not doing it right. This is the only way, through constant effort and sacrifice, how great products are built. To cover a little bit of content, what we've talked about for the last 30 minutes, Seven small steps on how we build product in Europe. We chose NPS as our main metric. We identified product pillars by categorizing NPS. 
We validate convictions via A-B testing and user testing, you name it, we do not over-test. We ingrain that it's good to be comfortable to do things that are right, even if they are hurt. We identify valid aggregate metrics based on the pillars, because the pillars themselves may not be that useful. We work hard, and we constantly learn and reevaluate in a cycle-based routine. I think the only mandatory thing in TransferWise is a cycle-based plan. We do plan to align, and it's a, the only thing that holds us together, truly, besides the mission and the values. And it's very, very good to set yourself straight limits within which you want to execute and deliver. And yes, none of us know what we're doing. It's fine. Just work through it. And yeah, since I'm flying all the way from London, I need to do a little bit of commercials in the end. Uh, so yeah, we're all over the world, have nine offices in a bunch of countries on a couple of continents. But there are 600 people in nine offices in seven different time zones. What we all believe, and I say this absolutely truthfully, that what we're doing is really not a job. It's a change for the good in the world's financial system. Maybe not the most important part of the world's financial system, but we believe that we're doing an irreversible change for the good. So, yeah, if at any point in time any of you want to help us with that, we struggle and we need help. Onwards. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for the talk. It was great. And I'm actually a, like a user, like over two years now. And so I'm using the TransferWise and I think I transfer a lot of money with TransferWise. But the problem that I have with the platform is that you cannot, like, if you have, like, let's say, two, three businesses together, and then you have to create a new, um, a new page and a new account for each one of them. And it's really a trouble to manage all this account. I sent you a feedback, and you guys <laughs> gave me a response. And <laughs> but the thing is that in terms of, like, engineering aspect, and, and if I want to have like in further on if you had the API or something like that that later on I could use but in terms of like let's say I have three companies and then for each company I have to create one and then I have to transfer uh, transfer each one of them so it's, it's a pain and, and it's a big pain uh, although it is governed by regulation so there's a lot of regulation going around all of the countries are very different, depending on where your com companies are registered. Your companies may be registered in different countries, do different things, do different businesses. Are you a partial or a whole owner? Financial sector is one of the most regulated sectors in the world. And there's a lot of rules that we just need to comply by law. And there are a lot of rules that we need to comply by with our partners, because we're still working on top of the existing world's banking system. A, we do have an API, uh, so we're, it's not perfect, but it works. So we are trying hard to, to push people to use TransferWise a lot, especially engineers and companies, because in the end, we're only 600 people. The only way we're going to change this for good is that we're going to get help from people to build this platform with us. And that API is like the first step for that. Uh, so yeah, please do try it out. Uh, we're actively testing it. So that's one thing. And the second thing, really cannot answer on how can you have your one account with a couple of business profiles. It's just a very hard topic. I'm sure that, it, yeah, we're just not set up engineering-wise for that. But thanks for the feedback. Thank you for your presentation. I'm also a user of TransferWise, and was part of the reason why I was motivated to come today. I think it's a good product. Um, but my question is, about the structure of the company, you said there's 600 people, uh, um, 50 teams. Is that correct? Yep, around and, that. And about or 60. And about 12. So about 12 people, plus or minus probably two or three yeah, per team. Pretty much. So, it, it, and you mentioned each team identifies their own KPIs. Okay. So it seems. A, I mean, if I had to run that business, or if I were on one of the teams, it seems that it could get a bit chaotic. How do you get like? 
how do you guys fought, like get information from each team? How do you not silo since there's mm -hmm. so many teams? Can you talk to me a little bit about the structure and knowledge share? That's a perfectly, that's a great question actually, because uh, we question ourselves constantly on this topic. F first of all, uh, in an organization like this, you wouldn't run the business. Like nobody runs the business. Like a CEO of the company, with all due respect, does not come to our team and says like, you're doing this tomorrow because this is important. We're like, nope, that's it. Because that's ingrained in what we believe. So that's one thing. It can get chaotic. And the biggest danger here, in my personal opinion, is work being done twice, eh? and creating a non-homogenous product. So some, some teams just do stuff differently. We don't really govern and control that. So we lack standardized um, views and that kind of stuff. We do have branding and we do have guidelines, but like, no, not everybody follows that because like, we, we're not babysitters. We don't hold people by, people by hand uh, every other day, unless they ask. But that's why we plan. So planning cycles is great event in order to align stuff that we do and challenge each other whether stuff just needs to be done in general and it changed over time because when your organization is like 50 people and 600 people it really works differently like a couple of years back plannings were done like in 30 minutes for a quarter now it's a week-long event and a bunch of teams preparing and gathering data and that kind of stuff. But yes, I do believe that planning uh, is the only way to align and avoid double work. And regarding getting info from other teams, that's why we're independent. We try to identify KPIs in a way that you do not have to create a dependency on the other team. If you cri critically do, this means that you're one team, in fact. And you just, well, become one. That's how we became one team. There was Euro as a currency and rest of Europe. We're doing like the, like the same things, just like different people. We're kind of, all right, let's just do this together because like we're talking way too much. Thank you, buddy. It was a, it was a great speech. Um, my question is, of course, you're trying to solve a great problem. It's a great cause as well. So why it took like five years to come up with a mission like and bring this cause thing is it some sort of like a marketing strategy or it's actually it is like you guys want to do something first like why it took five years and second is um, are you guys doing well financially in the year 2016 or 17 just wanted to double check all right uh, answering your first question mission is not kind of a zombie thing <laughs> like you cannot ingrain mission like it's not like a big old 40s corporate America where everybody sings a company hymn or something. No. Mission comes with a culture. Culture is the most important thing. Writing down a mission is more of a, just a reference thing, like documentation, just things to refer to. When you're in an argument, you can refer to something. Like, dude, we're on the same mission, and like what you're telling me contradicts that. That's just a very good reminder. So the same thing with values and that kind of stuff. All of these things are not forced. It's not possible to force them. You just hire people of a certain type and you create an atmosphere um, that allows the culture to flourish. I believe, like a lot of people also disagree with me on that, uh, but I believe that culture is two things. One is behaviors that you appreciate and disincentivize across your peers overall in the organization, and who do you promote and who do you fire? So the thing is, we're a flat organization, so like we really don't promote much. Um, but firing, it so happened with, we also don't fire that much. Just because your peers, I personally uh, came through a big personal transformation over the last eight months, uh, 18 months, because your peers influence you, because you meet and you spend 10 hours a day, sometimes more, sometimes less with them, these people are bound to change you. That's why we, we really don't have a need in like formal hiring, firing kind of cut thing. Regarding finance, no, sorry, I cannot answer that. It's like 
data that I cannot disclose. We're, we're growing. We're happy with our growth. Um, we would like to grow more. We're trying to do it. Any other questions? What the fuck happens when there is no one else on the other side? Sorry? So I move money to another country and no one else is on the other side. What happens? What do you mean? Like just to an, a non-existing account? No, no, no. It's peer-to-peer, -peer, right? So I want to move uh, money to ah, I don't know, all right. Zimbabwe. Well, it's a, very, it's a very simple answer. There are countries that we only are allowed by regulation to send money to, like China, for instance, or. No, no. I mean, like. All right, but th there's G no, no one on the other end to fund yeah. the. We buy, we buy currency and we hold currency on the other end. Um, the only big difference is, since we're financial company and we do have access to the financial market, we buy at the mid-market rate. That's why it's called mid-market. So the rates that you're getting in your bank or in Western Union is just a myth that is being hidden. In fact, establishments like Western Union or whatever buy currency by the mid-market rate that you see in Google. That's our main thing. Like We, we buy what we sell. Like it's, There's no interest to play with the So there's exchange. never been like a single case where one was like, oh my god, I can't use it. There hasn't been a single case where a user couldn't use TransferWise because... Except for the current, like, so there's a bunch of cases why people can't use this. Some, not all people have bank accounts. These people cannot, unfortunately, use us yet. Or, like, they're politically involved, or they're being sanctioned, or whatever. Or they're terrorists. Like, we're a company that is obliged to protect people, uh, protect people's money from fraud and, and that kind of illegal activities. Of course, those people cannot use us. So that's a very big topic. Um, I'm not a very big pro in money laundering. I only know the basic concepts. We do have a special team called AML, anti-money laundering. Um, so there are, like, to give you a little shed of light, um, so there are regulational things that a company needs to do in order, like, governmentally enforced. In terms of an engineering, that's a very complex topic for like a way, like for another two hour talk. It's actually a very interesting uh, engineering problem as a whole, because you will, you cannot actually find out that you catched all of the bad guys, right? So it's all false positive measured, but there is science behind that. And it's a very interesting product. Yes, we use machine learning here and there, not that much. Though, but yes. This is code within your own team. Um, and you talked about NPS for your team. Are other teams using other metrics? What were you using before? Because um, you, you talk about these new. Three routine. years ago, like who the hell knew? <laughs> we used everything. Yeah, well, I would, no I would like to. I would like to hear about like this kind of trial and error, trial and error kind of thing. I like, think, and um, how you come up to NPS to be the one metric that you wanted to use? That's a very valid question. So we're pretty random uh, in doing things. We believe that we're doing something right, but we really didn't have the skill set. And that's why we're autonomous, because we hire people with the needed skill set if we realize that we are really bad at something. I think the turning point came when Nilan uh, joined, our VP of growth uh, joined TransferWise, because he's been on a similar journey with a couple of different companies. And I think he was the person that brought MPS as a central metric for a consumer company, uh, consumer company into TransferWise. I do believe that MPS is the overall TransferWise general metric. At least I try to believe that. Um, but it really depends on the team. Like, because it's all numbers. It depends on like, how do you react on those numbers, right? Uh, we believe that we need to react on MPS. Some teams don't. Cool. Um, fraud team, for instance, would count their good metric would be fraud loss. Or virality team would have the virality coefficient. That's their main metric. Or conversion team, ironically, conversion. Uh, and there's a bunch of teams. Everyone has their own KPIs. Yeah, but, I mean, I we decided, yeah, sorry? Well, virality is kind of dictated by growth, so virality coefficient kind of translates into the, from the MPS, kind of. Um, but yeah, not all of the teams are growth-oriented. 
we are a product regional team. That's why growth is a central thing for us. I hope I answered <laughs> your question. Yeah, yeah, sure. Any other questions? So there, there have been uh, experiments with Bitcoin uh, a couple of years back. What we've uh, learned, so there are two problems here. A, nobody uses Bitcoin, like for international money transfer, just not the use case yet. And B, finance is a regulated market. You can't really regulate Bitcoin. That's why it would be literally impossible for us to use it and continue complying with the regulation. So no, uh, not that I know of, I don't think that Bitcoin is something in our nearest plans. Not this quarter, that's sure. And what about uh, the technology underpinning um, Bitcoin, for example? Blockchain? blockchain? Is blockchain something that could be useful to transfer-wise? That you know in your team? That you can of course. Um, overall, blockchain, also, like it's all my personal opinion. Um, Blockchain is a very elegant technology. I can imagine a bunch of, a bunch of use cases for it uh, within TransferWise. But the thing is that we're a company that is not governed by technology. We're a company that is governed by customers. So whenever there is a case where we where using blockchain would unlock certain value to our customers, then yes, definitely we'll do it. Otherwise, don't see it happen. All right. Thank you very much, Kirillo. Thank you very much. Thank you.